Hi, I'm Neil Bernstein. I teach at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio, and I'm going to be talking today about Virgil's Battle of Actium. So this scene occurs at the end of Book 8 of the Aeneid as part of the lengthy description of the shield that Aeneas's mother Venus gives to him, which contains scenes of Roman history, beginning with the foundation of the city and heading right up to the Battle of Actium, which is in the recent past for Virgil's listeners. So I'm going to ask just for this reading to think about this political poem as a panegyric, as a poem in praise of the ruler Augustus, not quite the same as our modern notion of propaganda. Secondly, as a work that's commissioned for which the artist received considerable compensation, but different from a work that he was commanded to write, a work that's creative and independent. So let's go back to that key term panegyric. What can this panegyric do? Well, first and foremost, it can praise the, re the ruler, as we see right after the description of the battle, we see Augustus triumphing and receiving tribute from the peoples of the world. And the whole shield passage has created a narrative of Roman history from the beginning to its present day. And as it's described in its last historical episode, a moment when Romans fought a civil war, it offers us a model of reconciliation after that civil war. Okay, so let's look at how the Battle of Actium fit into Virgil's lifetime and his creation of the Aeneid. So Virgil is in his 40s when we think he begins work on the Aeneid. When Octavian defeated Mark Antony at the Battle of Actium, Virgil was working on a work called the Georgics. And an ancient biography tells us that he recited the Georgics to Octavian as he was returning from campaign. Two years later, Octavian took the title Augustus, which we now use to refer to him. And, and by then, Virgil was hard at work on the Aeneid. Sometime in the 20s, he wrote the Actium passage. We don't know exactly when, but we know he could not work on it after 19 BCE, the time of his death. Now let's look at the actual battle. It took place off the western coast of Greece near a town called Actium, where Octavian and his Admiral Agrippa devastated the forces of Mark Antony and Cleopatra, forcing them to withdraw back to Egypt, where he conquered them in the following year. Now let's look at the actual Latin of the passage. Hinc ope bar darica variis quantonius armis, Victor ab aurorae populis et litore rubro, I get tom vir res corientis et ultima secum, bactra vehit sequiturque nefas, I get tia conjux. So I've highlighted in red the name of Mark Antony and the way that Virgil refers to Cleopatra as his Egyptian wife. He has made every effort to make Antony look like a foreigner, surrounded by Ope Barbarica and the peoples of the dawn, and so on and so forth. And this is part of his larger goal in the passage of making what was decidedly a civil war between Romans look like a foreign war between Romans and Egyptians. So here are Antony and Cleopatra together on a coin signifying their political and military and personal union that they would use when confronting Octavian at the Battle of Actium. So let's look now at how this passage from the Shield of Aeneas fits into the larger context of the Aeneid. It's not the first time that we've had a prophecy involving 
the present day. Right at the beginning of the poem, in book one, Venus goes to Jupiter and asks, what is going to happen to my son? It looks like he almost died in a storm. And Jupiter reassures her, tells her to put aside her fear and forecasts an empire without end for the Romans. Then later in book six, Aeneas descends to the underworld to meet his father Anchises, who similarly gives him a vision of what for Aeneas is the future, but for the Roman reader is the recent past as it culminates in the age of Augustus. Now, Aeneas doesn't understand, well, first off, he doesn't hear Jupiter's prophecy in book one, and he doesn't understand all the details that he hears in book six. Similarly, when he looks at his shield, Virgil specifies that he's ignorant of the matters that he sees. So it's for us, the Roman readers, to look at this version of history that Virgil has given us and ask if we agree with it. This is one of many possible ways that Virgil suggests that we can reconcile after the Civil War by optimistically looking forward to a golden age. As we'll see when we reach the end of the poem with Aeneas standing over the corpse of Turnus that he's just killed, there are other ways to model reconciliation after civil war. Aeneas hasn't given us a very good model by simply killing the enemy champion. It's left to the people who come after this moment to work out the reconciliation between the Trojans and the Latins, but Virgil isn't gonna tell us how that happens. Let's look now at how Virgil's contemporaries, other poets working around the same time that he was, represented the Battle of Actium. By doing that, we'll better understand the choices that Virgil made in his version. So I want to look very briefly at two other poems, which are not on your AP syllabus, but help us understand better through their example, the choices that Virgil made. One is Horace's poem, Nunc est bibendum, now it's time to drink. Why should we do so? Because we're celebrating the defeat of Cleopatra. So Horace tells us that we're free, that our feet are liberated and can begin to dance and that we can have a festival in honor of the gods in which we drink a lot because our hated enemy has been defeated. Horace then turns to focus on Cleopatra's defeat at Actium and how she ran back with Antony into Egypt. He then narrates how she committed suicide by allowing a poisonous snake to bite her. And he does, she does so, he says, to preserve her honor, to avoid being captured by Octavian's forces and humiliated by being led in triumph. So like Virgil, he represents this battle as a foreign war, but makes it entirely about Romans versus Egyptians. He does not mention Antony, although we know, of course, and as did every reader, that Antony was there. Finally, I want to look at Propertius's version of the Actium um, battle. Again, one that focuses on Cleopatra. And here in this passage, Propertius compares her to another foreign enemy that Romans had captured and paraded in triumph, the African rebel Jugurtha whom they um, captured in the early 100s BC. So Propertius said, oh, how unfortunate. It would have been a great triumph had we been able to lead Cleopatra down the straight, same streets that we had paraded Jugurtha. And like Horace, he turns to focus on celebration. His god Apollo, who had helped win the Battle of Actium by shooting his missiles at the enemy, now asks for the lyre, 
so that Hirsch's can play music for gentle dances. So looking at Virgil's version of the Actian passage in comparison to the contemporary poets Horace and Propertius, we see a couple of differences in focus. One is that Virgil mentions Antony, doesn't mention many other Roman participants on the side opposing Octavian, but at least mentions his presence. Second, he mentioned, he concludes with Augustus in triumph with the whole world paying tribute to the conqueror, whereas Horace and Propertius focus instead on Roman citizens' celebration. So we see here two different models of asking how we might pick up and go on after civil war. Thank you very much for your time and good luck on your exam.